So welcome tonight. We are so pleased that you're here. We're pleased to welcome Professor Al Camarillo from California here to the Twin Cities. He knows the Twin Cities pretty well, so I didn't have to coerce him too much in, in coming in. Plus, the weather is still pretty good right now. Um, tonight's program is part of the ICRC Global Minnesota Program, which is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. This is a new grant that is uh, meant to facilitate public conversations over the, uh, the nation's most challenging issues. And of course, as we all know, with one week to the election, immigration has become uh, one of the most hotly contested issues in our, uh, in our country. So Global Minnesota allows us to bring uh, the great work of scholars like Professor Camarillo to campus, scholars who work on immigration, race, and, and ethnicity. Tonight is our 12th event since we started in April. We still have a few more to go. We, we can find about, uh, find, about, find about all of our events um, online, as well as on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. But tonight, we are privileged to be joined by Professor Al Camarillo. Uh, even at the early stages of planning this grant, this um, grants like these take a long time to plan and write. And when I knew that we were thinking about immigration past and present, Al was at the very top of my list to bring to campus. Um, he is considered one of the founders of Mexican American and Chicano Studies. He received his PhD um, and then joined the Department of History at Stanford uh, in 1975. He's published and co-edited eight books and over three dozen articles dealing with the experiences of Mexican Americans and other racial and immigrant groups in American cities. These books include the seminal monograph Chicanos in a Changing Society from Mexican Pueblos to American Barrios in Santa Barbara and Southern California and the articles Navigating Segregated Life in America's Racial Borderhoods, 1910s to 1950s, and Looking Back on Chicano History, A Perspective, and many more articles. But it is his current work that I thought would be most appropriate for our discussion tonight as we consider the dramatic demographic changes that immigration is bringing to our cities. Uh, tonight's talk is from his forthcoming book, Racial Borderhoods of America, Mexican Americans and the Changing Ethnic and Racial Landscapes of Cities, 1850 to 2000, and it's forthcoming from Oxford University Press. In addition to his public uh, publications, Professor Camarillo has received many awards and fellowships, including one from the National Endowment for the Humanities, another from the Rockefeller Foundation, and over the years, Professor Camarillo has served as uh, the founding director of the Stanford Center for Chicano Research, the founding executive director for uh, Inter-University Program for Latino Research, the founding director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity at Stanford, and he's also past president of both the American Historical Association, Pacific Coast Branch, and the Organization of American Historians. So please help me in welcoming Professor Alfa Maria to Thank you for your generous introduction, and um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, we had conversations about the NEH grant some time ago, and I was delighted to, uh, to be uh, involved and to be invited. It's, it's natural for me to be back here, especially this time of year. Um, we had the, the good fortune of visiting Minneapolis almost every other weekend in the fall because our second son played for the Vikings. And so we would travel out here um, and get to know uh, Minneapolis and very fondly. So dear friends here, the Newberries and a number of colleagues in the history department uh, that, that I've known for a number of years. To share with you, Part of what is, is from this new book, uh, America's Racial Border Hoods, and I'll explain why, why I use that term, but put it in a much bigger framework of America's immigrant past and connect it uh, to America's immigrant present. I want to try to touch briefly on these topics, so we'll start out with uh, just to give a big overview of what are these trends in uh, immigration to the United States so that we can see 
things that are historical but contemporary. The threads that bind the, his, the American past when it comes to new people coming to the United States. So I'll give, give some, some uh, overview to that history. But part of that history, of course, is the reaction to the new people that came to America's shores, or whether they crossed a boundary, a uh, southern border um, over time. They're, what we're hearing in, the, in election 2016 is not new, uh, and I'll share with you some of that perspective. How have historians and others looked at what happened to these groups over time? How they've integrated, assimilated American society? I'll share a little bit about that because in the recent scholarship, recent as the generation of scholarship, very different perspective on how historians and social scientists look at the variations of the immigrant integration into American society. So I'll share with you some of that. Then I'll switch to talking a little bit about when those variations, when we took look in particular at ethnic groups and racialized racial minorities, there's a different trajectory for their integration into American society. And one of the things I will talk about and talk about in this book that will be out next year is about their, their, what happens to them when they come to American cities. Where do they live? Where they are allowed to live? Where they're not allowed to live? And I refer to them as racial um, borderhoods. And lastly, I want to take so sort of the big picture and then bring it home to Minnesota and to Minneapolis with some perspectives on both past and recent immigration that's affecting your state, affecting your city, and changing the nature of your local society as it's changing the nature of our, our national society. So um, let's start out even with a bigger picture. Immigration to the United States. Now, we don't have a corner on immigration. We are part of a much larger global phenomena of international migration, past and present, right? And so one question is, this would be the audience participation part, this is the quiz. <laughs> How many of you, so if we think about nations and the percentage of nation states that have foreign-born population. Now, how many of you think the United States is among the top 10? in the world in terms of the percentage of our population that is foreign born. How many how many do you think we're in the top ten? Okay. Top fifteen? Top twenty? Alright, well let's let's take a look. We're not even close. When you start looking at places like Saudi Arabia, Singapore, United uh, Arab Emirates, vastly larger for percentages of the population that are foreign born. Where do we, how do we fit into this scheme? Well, we're kind of in the middle. I think we're like 27th or something like that um, among the immigrant, um, the immigrant receiving nations, right? And we're more in tune with some of the Western European nations. But if you, if you switch it from percentages to numbers, overwhelmingly, we are a nation of immigrants. We have been and we continue to be. And there you can see in rank order um, how we fare uh, in comparison to these other nations in terms of the total number of immigrants. So yes, we are a nation that are that's still in the midst of dealing with foreign-born populations and their integration into American society. So immigration from 1820 to 19 uh, to 2010, let's call it. So if we look at the, the graph lines here, European immigration, of course, if in the new nation, we're looking at British, German, and into the 40s and uh, 1840s, 1850s, of course, the Irish potato famine and the huge migration of Irish to the United States, which continues in, in the antebellum period and after World War uh, after the Civil War. So if you look at a later period, European immigration continues to mount. And after uh, the Civil War, 
you have continuing immigration, but a different immigration. So by the 1880s, it's no longer the Irish or the Germans. They're still coming, but in far fewer numbers than the Southern and Eastern Europeans. So immigration from the 1880s to the 19th, to around World War I, America is preoccupied with the immigration of Eastern and Southern Europeans, the Italians, the Greeks, the Hungarians, East European Jews, uh, a number of other groups from Southern and Eastern Europe. And then the plummeting of immigration with Europe, World War I, and then America, and I'll talk a little bit about the impact of immigration policies, uh, seals off, for the most part, that funnel from Europe to the United States by 1924. Follow line, Europe never again surfaces as a major contributor to our immigrant population, at least relative to others. Take another line, look at that Blue line, North America, we're really talking about Mexico here, first and foremost. Four major waves of immigration from Mexico in the last hundred years. The longest, continuous, almost unbroken chain of immigration in American history. The largest total number of immigrants to ever come to the United States from Mexico. 1980s forward, you have to mix in Central Americans as well. But over this 100-year period, that North American blue line, that's Mexico. If you go to 1910 to 1920, up to about 1930, the first great wave, when a tenth of the entire population of Mexico came to the United States, principally in states of Texas and California, Arizona a little bit, Colorado. Two other major waves in the 1940s and 1950s, we call it the Bracero migration, and the first substantial undocumented immigration from Mexico in the 1950s. But nothing in comparison to the post-1965 fourth wave, the greatest wave by far, um, both documented and undocumented. Take a look at that other line, Asia. So what we get to see the narrative playing out, most of you know about this narrative, but mid-19th century, substantial Chinese immigration around the gold rush, the, the labors that, that allowed the western part of the transcontinental railroad to be completed. Another little spike, end of the 19th century, Japanese immigrants. Relatively few, in between because of immigration policies. I'll talk about those in a minute. And then post-65, 1965, a huge immigration policy shift and the takeoff period again of Asian immigration, primarily Chinese, but not exclusively Chinese. So we have different waves of population coming in at different periods of time. They're going to be affected by the nature of the policies, federal immigration policies. They're going to be affected in many ways by the resources they're bringing with them or the resources they don't have when they come here, which is going to affect them. The reception they receive by the American public and how they negotiate life in America. All right. Longview, if we look at contemporary society today and to see where the legacies of the, the major immigrant streams over a long period of time, this tells us, this is an interesting map because it tells us where that region, locality, is fundamentally important to understanding the nature of the immigrant past in American society. So, go to one region, the southwestern states from California to Texas. Well, no surprise there, Mexican origin people as they came from Mexico to the United States, we're going to settle in those historic areas for the most part. But a diaspora occurred as well over time that would take an increasing percentage of that population to places outside the American Southwest. Today, it's amazing that the second largest population concentration of Mexican origin of people in the United States, where do they live? Is it Dallas? Is it Houston? It's Chicago. Right? The diaspora. Your area, right? Like, so we go to 
uh, Minnesota, we see that the Scandinavian influence, the old immigrants, profound impact on this state, right? Agricultural, uh, to be sure, but as they go to small towns and to cities, Germans, to be sure, you can see the, the, the German light blue throughout that part of the, throughout the upper Midwest, Midwest and upper parts of the, of the country. If you were to, you can't see this too well, but Irish and Italian, primarily urbanized, northeastern Atlantic seaboard uh, population, but there's a diaspora <coughs> there as well. African Americans, of course, the south, but there, there's an enormous urban northern or western diaspora that occurs uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so those influences of the past are still very much with us today when we start talking about where do various immigrant groups have their greatest impact. That's when we really have to start talking about the, the states, the regions in which they're concentrated. But it's always a changing map. It's never staggered. It's always in the throes of change. All right, what's the dominant, what was the dominant story about what happens to these people when they come to the United States and make a life for themselves? Well, if we go back to the 1930s and 1940s, the Chicago School of, Assimil uh, of Sociology that developed what we call assimilation theory, uh, for over a generation, maybe almost two generations, the story was one told on the model of European immigrants. And the model, it's not to say that the model that the sociologists laid out for us to understand immigrant assimilation wasn't correct. There's aspects that are still that still resonate with us today that still help us explain how groups integrate into American society, how they become Americanized. But it's a uh, it's a static story, and for a lot of groups, it doesn't work. Basic story: come from a different country. There, you're going to come into the host society. There's cultural conflict. Religious, perhaps, linguistic to be sure, customs, other things. But over time, you start adapting. And that adaptation manifests itself in many ways. You start eating the cuisine of the whole society. You begin to incorporate English into your language repertoire. You become bilingual, perhaps. Um, your children go to school, the, the institutional influences on those children as they become American. And lo and behold, by that second generation, because of the impact of those institutions, it might be the educational institutions, the religious institutions that are American, there's going to be a transformation. And you're going to now, the second generation, identify as American rather than as a German or as Irish. You're first an American, and then maybe the ethnic later, secondary. You intermarry, you're totally absorbed into the institutional life of the United States. You are totally assimilated into mainstream America. It's too neat a story. It's not complicated enough. It's messy the way different groups navigate American society, and all kinds of forces, all kinds of factors are going to determine the trajectory of whatever group we're looking at, at their integration in American society. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So, immigrant integration, our revised story of the last 30, 40 years as we included more groups into the national narrative, groups that have been excluded, like Mexican Americans, been fundamentally excluded from historical narrative until the last 40 years. Asian Americans, for the most part, have been excluded too, because if you go back to the assimilation models that I, I mentioned, it was primarily a European immigrant-based um, analysis, right? The time of when people come to the United States is going to have a huge impact. Um, an immigrant coming in 1915 is fundamentally different than an immigrant coming in 1970 for such obvious reasons. But even more important, are you legal 
or are you legal? Illegal? Is there an undocumented status? In the 20th century, there's there are people that are undocumented, and it's not just the last 40 years. Um, undocumented illegal aliens go back long into uh, the American immigrant past. Are you white? I mean, Eric and I have a good friend whose book is White by Law, talking about Italians. Go to Chicago. It's fundamentally different if when you come as an immigrant, you're considered white and Caucasian, as opposed to if you're Asian, you can never become a citizen. You're non white, and you will be that way for generations. Right? Differential, bifurcated status is at the time you, you immigrate. Where you're from, right? The nature of the of the of the immigrant of the sending society and how that's going to play out on the reception that you're going to receive as an individual as part of a group coming into American society. Mm -hmm. Are you going to a rural area in a farming community, or are you going to a city? That's going to fundamentally change not only your acclimation to American society but the reception that you might receive. What kind of work are you doing? We skip to the bottom as workers. Are you an urban worker, an industrial worker, working at, the, at low wage jobs, low skill jobs? Or are you coming in with summer sources? You're an entrepreneur. Um, are you a, a professional? These will fundamentally determine not only individual status as an immigrant, but group status. And these other things, again, federal immigration policies that will, will be benchmark policies that, that will, will very importantly determine what your status will be, not only when you enter the United States, but your trajectory um, as a citizen or quasi-citizen of the United States. And they're very importantly, I'm going to jump to this in a second here, as these groups come in, what are the structures, the attitudes, the ideologies that allow for particular groups to be included? That within a generation or two might actually fundamentally enter the mainstream of American society. But conversely, what are the factors, what are the situations that people encounter in which they face exclusion? Not just for the first generation as they enter the United States as immigrants, but their children, their children's children, and their children's children. Three or four generations. What happens? And we want to talk about that in a minute. Okay. With every one of these groups, over time, there's been rejection. There's been concerns. Issues were raised. Um, questions posed. Look at this one here. Are these all contemporary? Those who come here are generally the most ignorant people. They come in droves and they will soon outnumber us. And we will not be able to preserve our language. Even our government will become precarious. Second, we have room for but one flag, the American flag. We have room for but one language here, and that is the English language. And we have room for but one solely, sole loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people. Every immigrant who comes here should be required within five years to learn English or leave the country. And lastly, some of you know this one. Uh, but the simple truth is that we've lost control of our own borders, and no nation can do that and survive. Are these all modern? First one? Oh, man. Who is he talking about? The Germans. Damn, Germans are coming into Philadelphia. They're taking over our place. They're pushing us out. And they are actually swarthy people. He actually racialized Germans back way back when. So this thread of reaction and sometimes severe reaction to newcomers is a thread that runs throughout the, the fabric of American history. Who was the second one? Oh, Teddy! During the midst of the peak period of Southern Eastern European immigration to the United States. So he was concerned about, you know, they're coming in here with all different customs and languages, and, you know, we've got to Americanize these people if they can be Americanized. Some can be, others cannot. Uh, but concerns there. Last one, remember the last quote that, that for some of you, 
That's no surprise. That, that was Reagan, right? And he was talking about the contemporary, more contemporary, undocumented immigration from Mexico. Right? They're massing at the border, and we've lost control of our borders. But it doesn't stop. We, we've, seen, we've seen this one, right? This brings us right to the fore um, with, uh, with, with election 2000. I can't look at this too long. <laughs> but it's a threat. Go back to the 1840s, 1870s. Which group was maligned? It was the horrible Irish immigrants. Top, famous Thomas Nats cartoon. The Irish clad as Pope clad immigrants descending on the shores, reaching the shores, and good Protestant Americans are holding them back and protecting the children from the onslaught of the Irish menace. Or, contemporary period, the heathen Chinese are descended on us. They are bringing, they, they are creating problems for us because they're on free labor, they're racially uncivilized people, they're heathens, etc., etc. Drive them out. Right? right? Eric has written beautifully about this. Um, huge reaction, but a highly racialized, highly racialized reaction. But that's not to say some of these other groups that we that's for very hard for us today to say they, these people were racialized at one time. The racialization of groups, irrespective of whether they were Caucasian or not, occurred. More extreme for a group like, like the Chinese. Southern Eastern Europeans. Very similar racialization of much of these, many of these groups. Southern Italians, Sicilians especially, right? Swarthy, uncivilized, uncouth, low wage workers. So there was a racialization that took place with a lot of these groups, Eastern European Jews, malign population. What do we do? Well, they're amassing here, and we've got to shut off the valve by the 1920s with the second cartoon on the right. More contemporary view. Uh, I, like, I always like this one of, uh, of the, the Mexican border with the U.S. There's a hole in the fence. They're pouring in, in fact, you can get the map to the U.S., like the maps of Hollywood when you go to Los Angeles and visit the, the, the Star's uh, homes. Well, you can pick up that map, and as soon as you get in, you get free lemonade, you get free education jobs, you'll get even free health care, right? So the reaction, the more contemporary manifestation of this long, long-running uh, anti-immigrant settlement. These are interesting cartoons, too. Again, racialization of the... the Irish. Look at the Simeon characterizations of the Irish in the 1870s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So here they are the lazy, help the lazy Irish. Right? In the polls, they're affecting outcomes in the machine politics of, of cities um, and other depictions. So they're, they're dangerous terrorists. They're loading boxes with dynamite within a generation that perspective begins to change there's socioeconomic mobility not dramatic but enough that the characterization a generation later of the Irish in America has has begun to change they are the postal workers they are the firefighters they are the policemen, and in many cities, they are the leading politicians. So a lot of change occurred with this group, right? There was an integration. There was some assimilation. There was some amalgamation, and there was social mobility, despite being a generation earlier, two generations earlier, a malign population. Italians, same thing. Um, the gangster image, right, the godfather, uh, on street corners, this is New York City, you can stop and get a drink, you know, get a shot of wine and, and some sausage, right, typical kind of stereotype of, of, the, 
of the Italian immigrant. Also, the far, the one on the far right. Let me get closer on this one. Is this whether you agree? So look, look at the simian feature of this Italian boot black. And here's here's what the cartoon says. I don't know if you can see it from over here. A wop, a pound of spaghetti, and a red bandana, and a stilet, and a corduroy suit, and garlic would make him strong de mousse, and a talent for black de boot. So these are the stereotypes. These are the really pretty malicious uh, attitudes that are prevailing in American society at the height of their immigration, right? Around the turn of the century, a little before, a little after the turn of the century. But within a generation, you have social mobility, not dramatic social mobility, but in terms of impacting the popular culture of the United States, that next generation is having a profound positive impact whether it be Joe DiMaggio, or Frank Sinatra, or the mayor of New York City, LaGuardia. But you start looking at other groups. They, they too were maligned. You have the Chinese, Japanese, much more ingrained, uh, much more virulent uh, reaction that will put into play institutional responses that will, and coupled with racial attitudes and ideologies, that will fundamentally determine a different outcome for this popu these populations over the course of the second generation, the third generation, even into the fourth generation. And you can hear, you can see the, the malevolence of the, of the uh, caricature of, of the Asian Menace, the yellow pair of this one says in the middle. Mexicans, too, were subjected to this kind of, of racialization, but in a different way. They were white by law, right? Um, did that have an impact? Well, maybe so. But their outcomes are going to be fundamentally different than Italians, another Catholic population. Um, will, it, will their outcome be as extreme as the Asian experience? No, never. Uh, does it have elements of, of uh, racialization uh, comparable to some of these other groups? Yes. Um, it's a group that kind of fits in between. Far left, first wave of immigrants from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, 1910, 19-teens, and 20s. So the, they come in, they're they have a disregard for law, so that's what this, this backpack on this, this Mexican peon, right? So there's already a, a perspective on who's coming into the United States. Ignorance and disregard for the law. And, of course, the U.S. Immigration Service is looking the other way a lot because there's a dependence on Mexican labor increasingly in the United States. So there's a dependence, but a attention, if you will. There are also revolutionaries like Pancho Villa, who during the revolution raid into uh, a New Mexican community and stirs enormous reaction in the American population. And the first people who we could say are undocumented crossing that trickle of a, of a river, the Rio Grande, in the teens. But this is, this is the beginnings of 100 years of this sentiment about Mexican immigrants, uh, which we can see in contemporary society. All right. There's going to be immigration policies that reflect differential treatment of groups that are perceived to be either unassimilable um, or groups with, with, with such such resistance to them that you can no longer allow them to come into the United States. So the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the first racially motivated federal immigration policy, right, cut off more of the Chinese. Um, there are enough here that constitute a problem in so many ways. Skip to gentlemen's agreement from Chinese to Japanese. Hot, it's not a formal, um, congressional 
act, but it's it's in reaction to, and it's an agreement with between the United States and Japan. Japanese government no longer allow your citizens to come here, and we won't uh, segregate your children. Although that segregation continues, um, U.S. Border Patrol. Interestingly, 1924, when the federal government is creating the National Origins Act of 1924, Southwestern and Western agricultural uh, interests and their politicians beat back the attempt by a lot of congressmen to include Mexico in the National Origins Act. But by that time, agriculture in the West was far too dependent, transportation industry was far too dependent on Mexican labor. No more Europeans, right? So they were not included in that 24 National Origins Act, the quota, quota system. But a border patrol was established that year. And they placed 12 people on the 2,000 mile border to patrol the border, right? Era of fictional border with, with Mexico. But that 1924 act was not only to seal Eastern and Southern Europeans, it was to put the nail in the coffin of uh, preventing any further immigration from what they called the Asian Triangle, right? So the last piece uh, of legislation by the federal government to, to seal out uh, Asians. All right. For those groups whose who are the targets of a racialized ideology. And from that ideology follows policies and structures which are going to fundamentally alter the trajectory of certain groups as immigrants in American society. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of examples that we could pull out. For, so de jure, so legal segregation, you have to look at each group, see which one was going to have to endure the kinds of structures and policies that would make it so difficult for them, even if they wanted to integrate in American society, and even if their children wanted to assimilate in American society, it made it so difficult. So, for example, we think about the anti-miscegenation laws that affected Asians, right? Um, African Americans, long-standing. Did it affect Mexican Americans? Never did. There were no miscegenation laws that said that Mexican origin people couldn't marry whites. Right? Interesting difference there, right? As a result, there was a lot of intermarriage. More importantly, were these, well, what I call and other historians are called customary segregation or customary separation and exclusions. It could be in the public schools, it didn't have to be by law, it was just a custom. These students don't go to school with white kids. That's just the way it is. And it's a practice over one generation, two generation, it becomes the norm. Um, it could be in the, if it's not a school, it's a classroom or public facilities, swimming pools. It's just understood that Asians and Mexicans and blacks, uh, in California, this was widely practiced. The only day they could use the public swimming pools from the 1920s to the 1950s was the day before it was drained and chlorinated again. That was the day the colors could use it. That's just the way it was, right? Customary practice. Swimming pools, bathrooms. But the one that stood out and had, I think, the most obvious effect on the masses of people were the residential exclusions. And here's where I talk about the ethnic and racial, that there should be racial urban border widths. So, very quickly, there's four, four kinds of border hoods. Now, I take the term border hood when I look at particular groups over time to say, all right, there are neighborhoods, right? There are neighborhoods that were uh, designated particular groups, had a, uh, a stamp on a particular neighborhood. Um, and I'll give you some examples in a few minutes. And there's other groups that when we talk about the nature of their racialization, there was no opportunity 
or very limited opportunity to ever move beyond that neighborhood because these neighborhoods were bounded. They were bordered. You knew that you couldn't live in a particular area of town. You knew the only place where you could rent or buy a piece of property was this area designated for your population. And over the course of the 20th century, into the 20s, into the 30s, into the 40s, the ubiquitous re racial restrictive covenant for particular groups was going to be yet another institutional constraint that reinforced where you could or could not live. And the federal government is partner to this in the 1930s, as a lot of historians uh, have, have written about in, in the last generation of scholarship. Um, the federal government was complicit in this because to come to be able to uh, effectively apply for and receive an FHA loan, the federal government determined which areas it would allow funding for mortgages. And lo and behold, one of the areas, they redlined, this is where the red lines come, you hear about redlining, if you go to those original books in the National Archives, you pull out these massive maps. If you're ever there, and you want, they're, they're fundamentally important Wonderful, wow, well, I shouldn't say wonderful documents, certainly telling documents. You open up these, these uh, huge maps, and where there's the red, they actually use the red line. You can tell where racial and ethnic minorities in any city in the United States are located because loans could not be secured for those areas. There's other places too, industrial zones, um, zones that are in transition, so it's not exclusively race. But it was fundamentally important for yet locking in another, locking in groups into where they could and could not live. So the urban ethnic and racial borderhoods were spatial areas, right? There were areas where you're going to live. It might be affected depending on the nature of the group by where you could afford to live, right? Not only where you're allowed to live, but where you could afford to live. And for most immigrant groups coming to the United States, it was the cheapest places the most run-down neighborhoods of any city. They were spatial divides because either through customary practices or real estate covenants later on, between the 20s and 40s, when they became really universally applied across metropolitan America, you knew that you were bounded by, let's say, Straight Street. You were bounded by Washington Street on the north. You knew where these communities uh, were located, and that determined where you could begin to, uh, to conceive of where you could live, uh, almost anywhere in the metropolitan America. They were temporal divided, what I mean by that, these are the locations where the, the cultural, the institutional, and religious lives of people are played out within these particular neighborhoods. And depending on which group you're talking about, because these apply, the, these urban borderhoods, ethnic and racial borderhoods can be applied to any group, right? Over time, and I'll give you some examples in a second. But depending on how insular, when I mean group insularity, how over time, how much over time a group was contained into a neighborhood, how they simply were not allowed because of overlapping factors to move beyond what happens to those neighborhoods, those borderhoods over time. Um, Multi-ethnic borderhoods, I'll give you examples of each use, transitory borderhoods and persistent racial borderhoods. And the last one's a product of what I call racial ideology, other people refer to, and the consequences of various policies, public policies, and customary exclusions. A bustling view of New York in Lower East Side of New York in 1910. Who lived there? Italians, Greeks, Irish, Germans, um, East European Jews, by 1910, Jews are beginning to stamp a, a cultural stamp on the area, but it's a multi-ethnic community, right? 
and it stays that way for a couple generations. A multi-ethnic borderland. Also bordered by economics. No good upstanding Manhattan middle class person or professional would step foot in these neighborhoods. This is where the lower class live. This is where the other folks live. But it's an amazing, teeming tenement district of New York. At least this image comes out. Transitory quarterhood. Go to another part of the country. It's called Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles. And from the teens up to the 40s, incredibly multi-ethnic population. It was the center of the Jewish population that had moved from the east to, Los, to the eastern United States to California. And at that, this time, around early 1940s, before internment, substantial Japanese population, there was an African-American population, uh, a, a growing Mexican-American population, an Italian population, a Russian population, truly a diverse, multi-ethnic, but transitory to what? Within two decades, it is overwhelmingly 90% plus Mexican barrio, a Mexican racial border book by the late 1940s, early 1950s. And then you have a place like Harlem. Started out as actually Harlem, most people, unless you've done some research and reading about this, was a middle class neighborhood of, of, uh, uh, of white Protestant uh, second, third generation Americans. But there was an opening for African Americans who were being crowded into other parts of New York neighborhoods to rent and lease land. And the owners of, of large structures like this were subdividing and the, the increasing number of African Americans were allowed to live in these increasingly overcrowded areas, uh, buildings in Harlem. And over time, as the Great Migration takes off, the emergence of the, of the Harlem ghetto, the, the African-American borderhood becomes solidified. And over time becomes the largest, uh, pre-World War II, the largest African-American borderhood in the United States. Or take, go to elsewhere. Chinatown, San Francisco, was the first racialized borderhood or ghetto in the United States. Beginning of the 19th century, it was absolutely understood in the 19th century that as the number of Chinese increased in this particular part of San Francisco, it was a bordered neighborhood. You knew you couldn't go across this street to ask for rent or you know, the resources to purchase them. You knew this is where, if you were Chinese, you lived an increasingly um, congested and deteriorating part of the city. Right? This is pre-tourist San, San Francisco Chinatown. Let's take the case now for a few minutes of the Mexican-American urban uh, racial borderhood because it's only in the last 20 years or so that we have uncovered this part of, of uh, immigrant history of Mexican Americans being added to the national narrative and um, it's it's for a lot of people it's it's still kind of stunning I'll show you some why it's stunning so there I call it Jaime Crow Jim Crow had a cousin, and he moved west. And he was never as codified as his, as his cousin in the south with African Americans. It was more through customary, again, customary separation and segregation, customary practices that created a system where Mexicans, over the course of a couple generations, actually three generations, would be subjected to a racialized experience that kept them in their barrios, and kept them segregated in other ways. So let's take a quick view through this. This is not Alabama, right? This is South Texas. This bathroom is only for Americans. And if you're a Mexican in Texas, you know what Americano, Americanos means. It means white, right? This was everywhere in South Texas. And in the teens and the 20s and 30s, 
they were ubiquitous in places like Los Angeles. Or you could find this sign. We serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. So these were the telltale signs. No law said you couldn't go to these places. It was customary practice. You knew you didn't go into this restaurant. Or you saw this one. This was in Dallas, Texas. No dogs, Negroes, or Mexicans. So there was a you know, the, the multi-racial population there. And this is 1910 in Dallas. I think it was 1910. No, it was 1920s in Dallas. That it was clear you knew where you were accepted and welcome and where you could not go. Or this one, South Texas Town. This one admitted you. So you walk down the street, might say, you know, no, no dogs or Mexicans or uh, or Negro, but this one said, said meet the Mexicanos. We, come on in and eat. Right? This one, this this sign tells you we're going to serve you. Right? Um, five chile con carne. Some pretty good menu actually in this place. So you, you would go in there, right? You know you're welcome. Other manifestations of Jaime Crow. South Texas Town, that's the American school. This is a town with 80% Mexican-American students in the school. There's the Mexican school. One school, right? You simply were not allowed to go to that white school, regardless of the numbers, regardless of whether you spoke English, regardless of whether you were smart. Elsewhere, Westminster, this is Hoover School, in Westminster, Orange County in 1946, when the first um, successful racial desegregation of a school, of a school system took place, right? It involved the Mexican kids who were um, excluded from the white schools in Orange County. And so uh, this, by this time, we estimate, we don't know, between 80 and 90% of all Mexican children in the Southwest, either went to a Mexican or in a Mexican classroom within a, a white school or, or were put into a Mexican school. So these are the manifestations of a high necro system. Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Santa Barbara, 1923. There was only one racial minority of any note in Santa Barbara. They were Mexican origin people. All right, let's turn now to the regional, to the local. So what am I telling them? Basically trying the story. We have to look at the national picture. We have to look, understand at some of the national phenomena that are driving um, the reality of immigrant groups. But at the same time, we have to take a look at the regional concentration, the regional, the local, the state, the county, the city, to get a grasp of what's happening to different populations over time. Um, so in your state, and in this city, we have to take a look at the older, the newer, and the newest. We have to understand the impact of immigration policies, especially for a place like Minnesota, post-65. And I'll explain what secondary migrations um, mean and how they've affected a state like, like um, Minnesota, but a lot of other states in the nation that have never had large-scale immigrations before. And then we'll look at the Twin Cities and some of your multi-ethnic neighborhoods as a result. Now, that's not, there, were, there was a celebration long ago of the old immigrants. This is your 1925 um, North American Centennial Celebration at the Minnesota State Fair. And when we were coming to to um, uh, Minneapolis, uh, our son told us, I've got to take you out to the State Fair. It is a phenomenon to behold. <laughs> and lo and behold, we love it. But it was for a Californian coming to Minnesota. It was so clear to me the ethnic resonance of this State Fair with the old immigrants, the Scandinavians, right? It's still there, very much so. Mexicans. Over 100 years, almost 100 years have been coming to this part of the country. And they first came to harvest as seasonal agriculture workers, the beet, beet industry, other produce picked in your hinterland. Uh, they were the seasonal farm workers. 
But over time, relatively small numbers, right? Over time, um, those farm workers fell out of the seasonal migration and settled in towns and settled in cities like St. Paul and Minneapolis in small numbers, not huge barrios like the Southwest, the urban Southwest, but their numbers were increasing over time, especially in the fourth wave, the post-65, really post-1970, fourth wave, great numbers, and secondary migrations. What is secondary migration? An immigrant from Mexico first comes to, example, Los Angeles. Huge metropolis, that's where the jobs are. But over time, that job, that, that labor market gets saturated. Um, harder to find job, maybe harder to make a go of life in a place like Los Angeles. So you head out to Chicago, maybe. Or maybe you have a relative that's come to Minneapolis or St. Paul. And that migration, the secondary migration, begins to occur. That's part of what's happening in the diaspora of the Mexican origin population with the fourth wave. Who would have thought that Latinos, Hispanics today, are an important part of the electorate in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, um, part of the diaspora, secondary migration? So your state has had a hundred years of immigration. They are the newer and the newest migrants. We can talk about, by the way, that's over. There's no more migration. It's zero. Despite what Donald Trump's telling us, net immigration from Mexico for the last four years is zero. It's not an issue anymore. It's an issue of what you do with the people here that are both undocumented or struggling uh, documented immigrants and making their way through society. But the 100 year uh, period of immigration from Mexico, any demographer would tell you it's over. Here's your list in order of all the immigrants that are in your society, with Mexico being the largest. I was surprised when I Look at this, uh, some of the data that, that uh, immigrants from India are, are your second largest uh, concentration of, of immigrants um, in 2010. And of course, we know about uh, Laos and Vietnam and Somalia with refugee policy. Again, the impact of refugee policy in the second half of the 20th century um, on uh, a place like Minnesota and its diversity. But it's a, it's a substantial part of your society when we look at the, the local, we look at the regional. Um, you have your, your immigrant population in the last uh, 20 years has grown twice as fast as the nation as a whole. They're pretty staggering, right? Now, the number to start with is, is relatively small, but in terms of the percentage, substantial. One in six children have at least one immigrant parent. When I saw that, gee, that's Way more than I would have thought, right? So the saga continues and it unfolds. One in five children, the youngest um, child of an immigrant. So that young generation, what's going to happen to them? Those of prosperous professional immigrant parents would have a very different trajectory than the low skill, low wage, maybe undocumented immigrant in the midst of your communities. So again, part of the, the continuing saga of differentiation of different groups um, and their trajectories in American society. Uh, I thought this was a pretty interesting uh, picture of your contemporary society. Now, I can't call these neighborhoods borderhoods because no longer, post-1960s, do you have um, the legal structures the policies that keep people in place, people of color in place. Racial restrictive covenants don't work in the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Um, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Those, those policies unleashed people from the urban racial borderhoods into the suburbs in substantial ways. Another story, by the way, which I don't have time to talk about. Tonight, but look at your name, some of your neighborhoods in the Twin Cities. So the Greater East Side, 
quarter of the population is Asian, you have 15 percent African American, um, comparable Hispanic population, white population, which is probably way down from 20 years ago. I didn't track that over over 20, 30 years ago substantially. It's got, I know it's got to be down because this is the nature of what's happening to metropolitan America. In your North End, 32 percent Asian. 20% African American, smaller Hispanic population, and probably if not a stable, declining uh, white population. A couple other neighborhoods. Camden, you guys all know where these are, right? I assume. Mm -hmm. I pulled these off some research, so I, I, mean, I saw the map, but I'm not, I know some of these areas, but I'm not as, um, uh, I, I'm not as, as closely aligned to them as, as you are, of course. Camden. Smaller Asian population, larger African American population, and a small Hispanic population. But you move to the west side, you have the heart of the Latino population, which is overwhelmingly Mexican origin, uh, a black one. You have multi ethnic neighborhoods. The nature of the neighborhoods uh, of old are continuing in different light today. The saga continues. But we have to understand what's happening in contemporary American society that will determine the outcome of these groups and these multi-racial uh, neighborhoods. Wouldn't it be nice if we could maintain multi-racial neighborhoods? But they're all transitory neighborhoods. Where they're going, we're not sure. And lastly, for your state, who would have thought, how many of you have lived in, in Minnesota for most of your lives? Now, would you have predicted when you were years ago that you'd have a state profile of your population that looks close to the nation as a whole? So the more modern phase of immigration has affected a state that was impacted tremendously earlier with the old immigration, right? It really is the, the basis for the foundation of the state, but the more modern immigration is in the throes of changing the nature of Minnesota society. Where it goes, be interesting to see, and I'll close on that note. Thank you, folks.